on this week's episode the main event of godzilla versus kong begins blockbuster video continues to live on and is a time to return to arcade paradise all this and more as we reach our next stop the pcc multiverse Don't be alarmed. The quasi-shimmering light before you is a trans-dimensional gateway to other worlds, other voices, other thoughts, and other realities. Up feels like down, and down feels like the number seven on a Wednesday morning. Don't worry. That quivering blood-boiling sensation under your eyebrows is all a part of the charm. Welcome to the PCC Multiverse. And we're back with another episode of the PCC Multiverse. This is Gerald Glasser from Pop Culture Cosmos, Game Source, Inside Sports Fantasy Football, and the Lakers Fast Break. We truly appreciate everyone out there listening to all of our shows. And if you can, please give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Plus, if you can like, share, subscribe, follow, or do anything that you can to support us right here at Pop Culture Cosmos, popculturecosmos.com or anything else that we do right here at the Pop Culture Cosmos, including our amazing tabletop games we run virtually every day on Pop Culture Cosmos on Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook. It is sincerely appreciated. But it wouldn't be a PCC Multiverse without my good friend. He's our own blockbuster video of Pop Culture Cosmos. You got to check out what he's doing today at popculturecosmos.com. His awesome book, Congratulations, You Suck!, which you can get right now at Barnes and Noble and Amazon.com, plus his shows, Topic Ocalypse and the Super BS Gamescast. It is my good friend. It is Josh Peterson. What's up, man? Uh, what's going on, man? Not much. Just, just here, you know, here doing pop culture stuff. Well, I truly appreciate you stopping by on today's program. As we noted before, celebrating his fifth anniversary is our good friend indeed marcus de la garza so we want to give him another shout out so hopefully he's doing well we want to thank you for stepping in on today's program we've got a lot to talk about my friend because we've got godzilla versus kong the battle is finally live and playing all over the world we have some thoughts on it i've seen it i know a lot of people are talking about it already so we have some thoughts already on it on today's program Speaking of Blockbuster Video and Josh's shirt, he obviously has a love and affection for the nostalgia that is Blockbuster Video. But Blockbuster Video is coming up in the news recently with the last Blockbuster on Netflix. Plus, I also have an interview as well with a guy who was actually on that documentary and has his own Amazon best-selling book out right now. And this is one you got to catch. Please check out this book if you're interested at all in the whole blockbuster video phenomenon and if you're interested in reading more about it built to fail the inside story of blockbusters inevitable bust it's a amazon bestseller and i have the author alan payne coming up on the back end of the show plus the controversial game that's coming out later this year six days in fallujah a lot of controversy with that game when it originally was supposed to come out over a decade ago, and also the possibility of it may or may not be coming out later this year. I'm going to be talking to TJ Johnson coming up here in a bit about that as well. Plus, we've got American Gods being canceled by stars. The return of CSI, of all things, coming to CBS. And we return to Arcade Paradise coming up on the back end of the show as well. But first up, my friend, it is Godzilla versus Kong. Here we go. So I want to hear your thoughts, man. Here we go. Godzilla versus Kong. People seem to enjoy it a lot more than the last one. They're saying that, like, you know how we're talking about in King of Monsters, the humans kind of took a backseat to just the the chaos of the monsters. From what I've read, and I know you've seen it, it sounds like in this one, the humans have more of a story. But go ahead and tell me, what are your thoughts? That is part of the problem, my friend, because, you know, there's a lot of action in it. I will give it that. And the director who was just tapped to be the director of the upcoming Thundercats movie. So this guy is obviously riding high on the success of it because it's right now one of the most successful movies of the pandemic era. 
So a lot of people are really getting a side over because it's had great opening day numbers here in the United States for the limited number of theaters that are open. Plus worldwide, it's getting a lot of box office acclaim. I will say that I did get a chance to check it out and it does have a lot of action, but to me, it doesn't have enough action because anytime it gets away from the action, the movie, it just, you, you, you have to leave your brain at the door. You have to leave your brain and anything remotely conceivable to any type of believability. You have to leave that at the door because it is the proverbial popcorn flick. It is something that if you're going to go ahead and try to break it down, it's just going to hurt your brain because it, it doesn't make sense. And it really doesn't make any sense. Once people start talking, people start communicating, people, it just, it, it gets boring. It gets, it slows down. So thankfully there's only about 20 minutes or so of that, of the two hour movie. Most of it is the action and that's what we really want to see. But even the action itself is kind of funny because calm <laughs> gets his butt kicked every single time so you're wondering he was quite a bit larger than he was in kong skull island i mean a lot larger so he gave him the steroids to go ahead and match up mano imano against godzilla and you know he gets his butt kicked every time and then there's a new monster to come into play and how that monster is created and how that monster comes to life it totally goes off the rails there and that I think my daughter said it best when we were talking about Godzilla versus Kong and who won during the course of the movie. She said, when it concerns who won or who lost in Godzilla versus Kong, I think the moviegoer is the one that lost. Do they eventually say like why they're fighting? I mean, is that like a... Not really. They don't go really into depths on that. I mean, they go into a place that makes it even more unbelievable as far as for an area that Kong can be. And then there's a certain artifact that only Kong can hold that will help him in his battles. And and then you see that being utilized and it goes off the rails and it goes off the rails very quickly. Again, the battles are pretty cool. Amazing how all these buildings are destroyed and no one dies seemingly. (laughs) Oh, that's kind of how the last one was too. Yeah, it took a page out of Zack Snyder's BBS rule after what happened in Man of Steel. But yes, tons of buildings are destroyed and the battles are kind of cool, especially the sea battle. I think the sea battle is probably the best thing about it. They did have battles in the city and whatnot. But then there's also a third monster that gets involved and how this monster gets created and comes to life. I think it just it jumps the shark. For me, I give it a five and a half out of ten. It's there. It's it's laughable for all the wrong reasons. The dialogue is terrible. The story and plot lines are unbelievable and awful. The special effects with the monsters are tremendous. The special effects not utilizing the monster or having monster being the primary focal point are not so good. But again, overall, I think it's something that, you know what, just shut off your brain and have some popcorn and have a fun time. It seems like it's a spectacle film. It is a spectacle film. Yes. Yes, that it is. Yeah. Uh, It's something that I think anybody who's out there just to go ahead and have a good time or just to want to see a movie again at the movie theaters. It's probably going to be a movie that you forget about in a year's time because it's just it's that the whole movie has some ridiculous premises right and left. And again, it'll just leave you scratching your head if you try to go into some deep thinking about it. So try not to. But the movie's going to be a financial success. And I think that's what's most important here. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't sound like they were trying to be like a deep philosophical film. They just wanted to like really give you an excuse to see two monsters smashing things. And I, it sounds like they succeeded in that aspect. Like it's it, it's pure spectacle. Like it has no purpose beyond that and it answers that age-old question like who well i guess from what you're saying it doesn't but like everyone always says like what would happen if king kong fought godzilla and i don't think they really wanted anything else from that besides that yeah i mean if you're looking for something deep as far as a storyline is concerned go somewhere else because you're not going to find it in godzilla versus kong but what are your thoughts out there on godzilla versus kong here we go Are you ready to go ahead and check out Godzilla vs. Kong, or have you already? We want to hear your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. 
But before we hit the break, my friend and TJ Johnson, I just want to run down the last blockbuster on Netflix. You're wearing the blockbuster shirt. You're involved with that nostalgia, which I touched upon in my interview with Alan Payne, which is coming up here in a few minutes. But I wanted to hear your thoughts on the last blockbuster on Netflix, which he was a part of as well. You talk about Alan Payne and talk about the movie itself. Like, I would love to visit the last blockbuster. That's in Washington, right? It's in Bend, Oregon. I've seen like little mini YouTube docs about it. And like, it does bring back a lot of nostalgia. Like we all have those memories, right? Of going to Blockbuster and, you know, waiting in line and waiting by the return counter to see if someone returned the movie you wanted to watch or going in and not being able to pick up the back of a movie, look at it, see if it's something you want to watch. I don't know. I just, I miss those days. I don't have stuff like that anymore. No, no. And it's so funny because there is one left and, I think that last blockbuster is not going away anytime soon because of the nostalgia fact, because people will try to keep it open and people will keep supporting it by buying shirts like the one you're wearing now. And they'll go there and they'll, they'll do what they can to support it because it's a part of their history, a part of their memories and a part of their nostalgia that they have from the 90s and 2000s. I actually got a blockbuster like a, well, I guess you call it a board game. But I actually, I got that and we were playing it, a, you know, a couple months ago and it's fun. It has like a little trivia cards and you can build this, the blockbuster sign. And it's got a parking lot and you put cards in the parking lot to do certain things. There's a lot out there, man. Like there's blockbuster t-shirts, you know, he's going to like Spencer's now. You see like blockbuster blankets and hats and stuff like that. Like it's such a shame that it's become such like a pop culture phenomenon. But the people who are like pushing it are people who don't know what it is. You know, it's like when you hear kids go, what's in the box? And they've never seen seven before. That's what this feels like. And it's such a shame, too, because like I feel like this culture amongst any culture could really benefit from having that blockbuster experience. Want to be careful, man. There's someone right outside your window stalking you, waiting for you to go ahead and drop off that copy of Spider-Man 2. He's waiting for you. He's right outside. Yep, they're waiting. They want that copy of Mr. Deeds really bad. Exactly. I'm not going to say I never did that, and I never like gave the side eye stalking outside the store. Oh, somebody has that copy. They're turning it in. Ooh, good. That's the one I wanted. All right. Did you ever go in and you had money to rent a movie, but instead you blew it on a previewed movie that you liked? I'm not going to answer that question. I've done that did uh, that yeah I, okay i'll answer it yes i have done that as well so yeah what can i say what can i say it's the it was the life back then i mean you know you're like oh that's cool i want to get this movie you want to go in so you go in it's like when you go in to a store and you go in for a specific thing and you end up coming out with something else either that you didn't want necessarily or you're just beginning it to getting it or that you go "Ooh, i didn't know that was here i think i'll rent that instead yeah and then you bring it home to the missus and she's not exactly too thrilled that she did. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. What yeah. I do miss, especially with blockbusters, being able to rent video games like that's something that that's an experience you don't really get anymore. Like you can stream them via Xbox Games Pass or you can buy them, do it digitally online or go yeah. to the store. But you can't rent games anymore. You can't like Gamefly and Redbox or eh, they're Red not Box exactly... Yeah, Redbox doesn't do it anymore, though. Oh, that's like, right. That's right. Yeah, and their slogan is still like rent, you know, something about games and movies, but they only do movies. And then Gamefly is, from what I understand, like they only have so many copies now. And so it takes forever to get the games you actually want to play. Yeah. Uh, again, those days are going by, but it, it's so cheap now to some, get some of these games digitally. It's It's really hard to go ahead and justify renting anymore. So we'll... We'll see what happens, my friend. I mean, paying seven, eight bucks for only two, three days was something that, you know, it got harder and harder to go ahead and be part of that market simply because of the fact it just got so expensive to go ahead and rent games and it got so much cheaper to buy them. Yeah, but that was like the premier destination for kids like in elementary school who are going to have like sleepovers and stuff. They go to their parents and have them rent them like a, you can rent consoles too. Like you can rent the Sega Genesis, Super Nintendo, Nintendo 64 get a copy of like Mortal Kombat or Primal Rage or Mario Kart, whatever it was like you could go there. Everything you needed for a successful sleepover at Blockbuster, the video game consoles, the videos, the candy, the popcorn, like they had everything. It was your one stop shop for Friday night. And 
yeah, it's just it's a shame that that experience is is gone. You know why Blockbuster folded? Tell me why. Because you weren't part of the marketing department. You just had Seriously. the, the perfect slogan. Did you, did you hear my slogan right there? Yeah, Your yeah. one-stop shop for Friday night. Absolutely. That's what I'm saying, man. Too late? Well, what can I say? It's still a part of our culture, part of our nostalgia and pop culture. As Josh has said, you, know, you can actually get Blockbuster video products all over the place. But if you can, please support the last Blockbuster on Netflix. And support the last Blockbuster if you're in the area of Bend, Oregon. Right there at the final blockbuster right there. So if you get a chance, check out the last blockbuster on Netflix. Our guest coming up at the back half of the show is Alan Payne, an author who wrote an awesome, awesome book. And that book, again, is called Built to Fail, the inside story of Blockbuster's inevitable bust. He is actually in the last blockbuster on Netflix. So hopefully you will check him out on his appearance there as well. Real quick, can I just compliment this book cover? Like, this is really cool. I highly recommend it. It's a really good book to get the inner workings of Blockbuster, some of the decisions that were made. And obviously hindsight now being 2020, you see how the story unfolded from somebody who got to see glimpses of what it was like inside as he was experiencing it as a franchisee owner of Blockbuster. So definitely check out my interview coming up here in a few minutes from Alan Payne, the author of Built to Fail, the inside story of Blockbuster's Metal Bust. That's coming up here in a few minutes. But right after the break, it is my good friend, TJ Johnson. He's here to talk about Six Days in Fallujah and the controversy surrounding it. And also as well, his thoughts on Godzilla versus Kong as well. This is the PCC Multiverse. For the latest news and information, analysis and opinions on the Los Angeles Lakers and the NBA, check out the Lakers Fast Break podcast today on wherever you get your podcasts. It's Gerald coming right back at you here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. Want to thank so much everyone out there watching and listening. Got something a little bit interesting to talk about and somewhat controversial. Something that not a lot of outlets are covering or not a lot of outlets have detailed, put into thoughts yet, but there's a video game that's back in production, which actually was going to be released in February, but has been pushed back to later this year. It's a controversial game called Six Days in Fallujah. And if you older gamers out there are familiar with it, it is a game that was actually first talked about way back in 2009 and was going to be released by Konami in 2010. Now, this game covers certain aspects of the second battle of Fallujah, which happened over the the span of a few days back in November of 2004. But the Arab community is really up in arms over this game because of what it portrays. I believe it's a battalion of Marines. You're seeing it from their perspective as far as a first person shooter going in. and, And unfortunately, it's striking a lot of people in the Arab community the wrong way because of the fact that it's dealing with a lot of issues of that time in the early 2000s when there was heavy battles and the Arab community was really incensed about what was going on at that time. But here today to talk about this controversial game covering this area of time in the Middle East that was very, very hotly contested is a good man indeed. You got to check out what he's doing for us here at Pop Culture Cosmos every time he's on. It is TJ Johnson. And TJ, welcome back, my friend. I know you wanted to talk about it. I'm thankful that you did. In fact, we should have already been talking about it already because it was scheduled to come out in February, but it's been delayed to later this year. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Yeah, Joe, thanks for having me on. Again, Pop Culture Cosmos. Love it. Love it. So in regards to this Six Days of Fallujah, you know, I have to admit, it's been a while since I've played a shooter. A real shooter. I'm talking like, I've played, I, I, I dabbled with the Modern Warfare when it first came out, but to say that it, I've actually spent legitimate time with the shooter, um, it's been probably since Modern Warfare 3, years and years ago, back on the 360. So it's been a while. And the idea of jumping back into a shooter already does not really fascinate me. We've got shooters at Diamond Dozen, right? But then you, you you take a game that's on the premise of something so controversial, so close to home for so many people, 
on both sides. I mean, there are people that fought for the U.S. that are it's close to home for, and the people obviously that it's close to home for as well. Here's my thoughts on if this game one should ever see the light of day, and if it's something that anybody should really play. They've already made it very clear that they're going to tell the stories that are going to be on the ground. Now we can take that one or two ways. We can because you're following the U.S. troops. It, it can make you wonder if you're going to hear a U.S. version of the events of the Iraq War or of, of Fallujah, or if you're going to legitimately see what genuinely happened. They say it's supposed to almost be like a National Geographic, but in a video game format. Well, but let me say this. I mean, the inspiration yeah. came from a U.S. Marine who was involved with this during the six days in Fallujah that mm-hmm. happened during the course of the Iraq War. And mm-hmm. you're seeing a lot of it from his battalion's perspective. Gotcha. So when we're seeing it from that battalion's perspective, the question is going to be, are we going to see what really transpired from their perspective? Or are we going to see an unsanitized version of what really happened through our own accord? And when I say our own accord, through Americans who were theirs own accord, you know, there were some pretty horrible things that were done. You know, the use of white phosphorus, things that were done to civilians and, and non-armed personnel, which when you're in those situations, I, I it, it may be difficult to tell. I don't know. I, I've never been to war. I've never been in a situation like that. I mean, I, I can't imagine the amount of tension and the amount of stress that these guys are under. And I can't imagine feeling good about playing a game like that. Listen, I, there's a game that came out that I still haven't been able to play through. It was by Take Two, or it was 2K. And it was a really, really good shooter from what I understand. I just, I'm, the name of it's escaping me. But I guess my point is, I have a hard time playing games where I have to make a bad decision or where I have to make a decision that's going to be hurtful or controversial. You know, it's just, I can't play Renegade Shepherd, right? Every time I play Mass Effect, I'm always Paragon Shepherd. I'm not Renegade Shepherd. And the Are you talking about Spec that, Ops The Line? I am talking about Spec Ops. So there are a lot okay. of nasty things that even happen in Spec Ops, and it actually goes into the psyche of that person, of the main character, who, as he's doing these things, he's kind of falling deeper and deeper, almost like a kind of a trance, and he's losing himself to this place. Yeah, I remember so, that game being very highly rated as well. Yeah, and I've heard great things about the game. I And I, I bought the game. It was on sale on Xbox Live. I want to say maybe two weeks ago. I bought it like five bucks, and I just I haven't played it yet because... As I mentioned, I have a hard enough time playing the villain role in anything. And not that I'm saying that we're going to be playing the villain role, but there are just some things that I don't personally need to see. Remember Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, the no Russian mission, where you yes. have to go through the airport? And I mean, granted, you can get through that level for the most part without firing a single shot, but yeah. you're watching a massacre. That was very uncomfortable for me. Uh, it was very unsettling, and I was glad that they gave us the option to skip it at, after uh, a certain point. So I can't imagine being excited about playing something like this, and especially considering the political climate that we find ourselves in right now with all the hate generated towards people of color, people of different descents. The point is, we are just not ready. I don't think we're ready to handle that. We don't know how to not hate each other. And this is not going to do, in in my opinion, any justice, or it's not going to be any easier for us to to handle something like this again. For the people that went through it and lived through it, and granted, this is from the the perspective of of a Marine who was on the ground there. The brave men and women that went over there in the first place, rather they should have been or shouldn't have been over there, that's already a harrowing enough experience to have to come back and now you got to get back to civilian life and and learning how to not be on edge at every moment in time. And people have trauma from that type of stuff. And now you're, we're asking people to go through and watch that stuff and play that stuff and almost simulate it as if they were really there. The fact that just the, why we were there is so controversial enough. Now we're going to go into what happened when we were there. It just doesn't sit well with me. I think that it's important that those stories are told. I think it's important that history is is explained. I just don't know if we need that to be an interactive experience. Does that make sense? A documentary is one thing because we're along for the ride. 
that makes it more palatable. We're along for the ride. We're not the ones actually pulling the trigger. We're not the ones that are going through and and putting C4 on the door or whatever. Like, we're not there for that. We are there as a person watching a documentary type thing. But it's different when it becomes interactive cinema. It's different when it becomes something that you more or less have some form of control over. It hits differently. It's almost like you read a book and your imagination runs wild with what it could be. And then you see like a movie's interpretation of the book. And it may not live up to the book's comparison. It may supersede or may surpass the book's comparison but it takes away you imagining what happened in that moment you actually just get to see it so it takes away that interactivity if you will and when you play a game that's based on something like that it's different when you're in control it just doesn't sit well with my soul i I just i don't know if we are ready for something quite like this well it is six days in fallujah it is scheduled to come out later this year finally after a long period of time Basically, uh, again, it was introduced to the public in 2009 and may finally see the light of day coming up later this year. It's going to be available on all the current platforms, Xbox One, Xbox Series S and X, PC, and of course, PlayStation 4 and 5. Very interested to see about not only if it gets released, but the kind of pushback and blowback and controversy it will create at that point in time, because you know it's going to be on a lot of people's radar then when it comes out so we're getting the jump on it this week so i appreciate tj you talking about it and i cannot thank you enough for your insight but before we head on out my friend i know you watched a little movie little flick out there (laughs) called godzilla versus kong (laughs) you also got a chance to check that out so share me your thoughts before we head on out on godzilla versus kong it was a fun movie if you were walking into this experience expecting this greatest cinema of all time and you were sadly walking into the wrong film. this is not that kind of movie i mean it's a fun two hours just to sit there and watch and enjoy for a visual spectacle it's not winning any awards so if i had to rate it i'd probably rate it like a 6.5 maybe a it it, it depends on what day you catch me maybe a 6.5 to a 6 it wasn't terrible, but by no means the imagination was just like a great film. It was it was fun. It was an, it was a fun thing to watch. I enjoyed seeing the way that the director took liberties with the characters of King Kong and Godzilla. You definitely you've never seen a Godzilla quite like this. Very, very aggressive, very fast, very agile which is surprising because that's never been the way Godzilla's been depicted in anything. Even the most recent of Godzilla films, he's never been depicted as fast, nimble, quick. That's never been him. So it's it's interesting. I mean, you know, we've seen this type of thing with other movies and pop culture references. For instance, you know, when they dumb down Captain Marvel, the director has them at a certain power level, and then you get another director who's like, okay, we got to bring that down a notch. They turned Godzilla up. They turned King Kong down. No big deal. It was still a fun movie to watch. It was enjoyable. I laughed. We all laughed at a few different scenes. It was it was fun. But don't go in there expecting this revolutionary tale of good versus evil because it's not. It's not it. Yeah, and if you check it out, you're you're unsure of where Godzilla's loyalties lie, and you know it's <laughs> funny because they took the bbs way of doing things yeah. with all the destruction but very little actual people killed even though you know you can see yeah you, okay yeah. all the buildings they are managed to there. get everybody out they managed to evacuate yeah. the city, they managed to course. evacuate the, these entire cities that that were yeah. involved amazing how that <laughs> happened but again it is tj johnson my good friend appreciate all your insight as always right here on the pop culture cosmos if you want to see the coolest action figure collections out there, the stuff that you played with as a kid, hear from industry insiders that made the toys that really truly defined who we are, then you got to check out season one of Action Figure Adventure. And that means right now you've got to go to Big Bad Toy Store for the two disc Blu-ray to check out all 10 episodes. I guarantee if you grew up playing toys, you will love Action Figure Adventure. Wow, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. Almost promo worthy there. But, you know, I already asked you for fresh new promos, but that's beside the point. I knew I was supposed to write something else. 
It's Gerald Glassford coming right back at you here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. want to thank you so much for listening and watching right here worldwide on radio and also wherever you get your podcasts. Really excited to go ahead and talk to this next guest. Just the irony of a documentary out currently that's available on Netflix called The Last Blockbuster, which my guest is in as well and has quite a few things to say. But he is, again, the author, as I said earlier on the radio, Built to Fail, the inside story of Blockbuster's inevitable bust. It is Alan Payne. And Alan, I truly appreciate you being on the show today. But tell me the irony in the fact that a documentary called The Last Blockbuster, which you are on, by the way, yeah. is actually on Netflix. It's, it was perfect timing. I, I did that interview over two years ago. That's how long uh, uh, Zeke and... Let's see, I forget the, the other producer's name, but they've been working on it for two or three years. And I talked to them a long, for, for a long time in Bend. That was in a theater in, in Bend where we, where we talked. And I told them then I was thinking about doing a book. That's kind of why they were interested in doing it. Plus, I, I was actually on the way home mm-hmm. from Alaska from closing our last stores in, in up there in Anchorage and Fairbanks. And that precipitated that interview. and pretty ironic that the week after my book came out that movie debuted on netflix it is so funny i mean i actually interview and i'm a good friend with award-winning director rob mccallum who also puts a lot of stuff out on netflix and just the time frame on when you film it to when it actually comes out you know when somebody buys it up or netflix buys it up or whoever until yeah. it finally comes out there is that buffer. There is that time frame. So it's kind of funny how the timing worked out on it. But you talked about as a franchisee owner of Blockbuster Videos back in the day, you talked about closing the last doors in Alaska. But there is still one left, which obviously yes. is the title of the last Blockbuster in Bend, Oregon. You visited the store, I'm sure, while you were around there as far as interviewing. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. The, the owner, Ken Tisher, is a, a, a good friend. And, of course, Sandy Harding is still running the show there. She's the blockbuster mom of, of Bend, but uh, kudos to them for sticking it out this long. I, they they still have no plans to close. I, I don't so, think they so, they should. Yeah, I mean now blockbuster video. You see pop people walking around with the shirts with the with the blockbuster video and remember, I mean Captain Marvel dropped into a blockbuster video and people were going crazy over it. And your thoughts on how blockbuster video is being revered and remembered, especially in that '90s era, as far as you know, our fascination with pop culture is concerned. Yeah, I, I I've thought a lot about this, and I I wish the people that were running Blockbuster had as much love for the business as the customers did <laughs> because I never got the feeling that the top brass in Blockbuster was really in love with the business and had a passion for it. I did, and a lot of franchisees did, yeah. but I never got the feeling that they did. It was kind of a commodity that they all used for you know, different benefits, but depending on who we're talking about, you know, in, in the in the various time frames. But I just never got the impression they were in love with it. Uh, and we were, and, and, and most of our customers were, but they weren't. And I think that's why when somebody like Netflix came along and, and it was founded by people that loved movies. I mean, I knew Ted Sarandos back when he was a uh, just a district manager for a video distributor. And we would have never even imagined the, of where he is now. Yeah. But these were people that loved movies. And I guess in retrospect, it's not a surprise that Netflix turned out to be what it is. And that's something I want to go briefly into before we go into your book. And as I know a lot of people out there, in fact, like I said, my co-host has a lot of experience with Blockbuster Video. I also know a lot of other individuals that have either managed or work at Blockbuster Videos. Mm-hmm. I know, like you were talking about, there's such a sentimental time in their lives when talking about their experience with Blockbuster Video as being some one of their better experiences in their entire life. And for me as a customer, again, I also have those nostalgic views of it as well. But the the whole success and the behemoth that it was in the 90s everything seemed to change around you know maybe the earlier part of this century but your book goes into detail in regards to that and people have this preconceived notion when it comes to blockbusters demise they think oh yeah well netflix killed it netflix killed it da 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 it's in 
But your book and also the premise behind The Last Blockbuster, your premise behind that between the book and what I'm reading so far says that that's not entirely the case. Well, you know, you only have to look at the timeline. Netflix started in 1997. And of course, you remember, but a lot of people don't remember that Netflix for the first 10 years of its existence mailed DVDs through the, through the postal service. That yeah. was their business. They didn't even begin streaming movies until 2007. And even then, it was just kind of a, a novelty. It didn't become a real significant part of their business for another two or three years after that. Blockbuster was in big, big financial trouble 10 years before Netflix ever streamed a movie. And there was all kinds of reasons for that, which are in the book. But but just the simple answer is that Blockbuster was in real big trouble financially and, and in a deep and what I call the death spin in the book long before Netflix ever even started streaming. Yeah. And Blockbuster did have the opportunity as, you know, business lore is out there. Yes. Blockbuster yeah. did have the opportunity in 2000 to purchase Netflix for a paltry $50 million. I, I, as you go about it today in your book, and I'm sure you've been asked this question already a ton of times, what level of regret do you think the individuals that could have had that decision to go ahead and purchase it, what kind of level of regret do you think they have now at this point? Well, that would have been John Antiaco because yeah. he was the CEO at the time. And, you know, I've never heard him address that question. Of course, I've never heard him be asked that question, but I'm sure he would say, I'm just speculating. I'm sure he would say that at the time, because of uh, they were right in the middle of the dot-com bust. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure they would say that Netflix was just another one of those companies that was that would never make it. All they had to do was study what Netflix was doing. They already had a quarter of a million subscribers. Yeah. DVD was just getting started. It only had like maybe a, a five, 10% share of, of homes at the time in the country. All you had to do is just kind of do the math and you could figure out that if they just kept up the same rate of growth, it was going to be a big company. Yeah. But Blockbuster, by all accounts, and most of the accounts are from Mark Randolph, who was the co-founder and was in that meeting, and he wrote about it in his book. From all accounts, Blockbuster never even really dug into to what Netflix was all about, didn't understand it, just kind of put them off, and, that was, and the meeting ended, and that was it. And then, unfortunately, later on, Blockbuster tried its own hand at the streaming and videos by mail market. When that was first proposed to you, did you think it was going to be something that was going to be a home run? Well, there's no reason why Blockbuster couldn't have built a successful buy mail business just not, just like Netflix did. Yeah. But like we were talking earlier, I just don't think Blockbuster management had the passion for the business. So when they finally decided about five years after that meeting uh, where Netflix tried to sell them, it was about five years after that they that they finally decided to get in the business. Yeah. And and they needed franchisee cooperation. So I was actually a part of a task force that that listened to them and you know, and because they, they needed us to work with them. And we kind of knew from the start that they weren't fully committed to it. When they rolled out their by mail program to compete directly with Netflix, it was inferior in virtually every way. And even though it had a fast start it flatlined pretty quick and growth slowed down the, and, the, and the business was unprofitable. The only thing that Blockbuster ever did that, that created a threat to Netflix was creating what you probably remember, the free exchange in the stores, which they yep. call total access. So they were basically using the store inventories to subsidize their buy mail program, which did indeed ramp up the subscription growth. They, they were actually growing faster than Netflix for about a year. And got up to three and a half million subscribers, which was not that far behind Netflix at the time. It was wildly unprofitable. And in my opinion, was killing the stores because there's no way that they could afford to put enough product in there to keep the store stocked and allow their buy mail customers to come in and take movies for free, which yeah. is what total access was. Yeah, I just completely disagree with that. Had the concept come out sooner, I think, and embraced, like you said, by the, the management above and, and maybe marketed a little bit differently, things could have changed and fallen into place as far as Blockbuster concerned. We could be very much talking about Blockbuster 
being still a great part of our lives at this point, other than what we talked about as far as from a nostalgic purposes. I mean, like you said, if they had the passion for it, it could be in a very different ending right now for yeah there, there's no reason blockbuster couldn't have done the same thing netflix did they had more resources at the time financial resources and netflix really never did get the, the buy mail business never got near as large as the store business yeah but what netflix did was they took the knowledge that they learned from that business and transformed it into streaming and and the biggest part of that that i think is the most interesting is that the buy mail business in general could not mail you new releases very efficiently because, as you know, the life cycle of a new release is very short. The economics just didn't work. So Netflix had to build a business that kept their customers happy with older movies. Yeah. And they did that in an unbelievably successful way. And that's really, I believe, why Blockbuster never understood how Netflix could turn a profit by doing it. They were doing it because they were they were mailing movies that were not in high demand. They were convincing their subscribers of here's something that's just as good as the new release of the day. And they did a brilliant job of it. And I think they used that knowledge to build their streaming business where so much of streaming is older movies. Yeah. And block, wow. that was a concept that Blockbuster never understood. And it was something in our stores. And one of the big reasons we lasted so long is we were just as big in the old stuff as the new stuff. And I, that's what I think a blockbuster store had to be to be successful. And the corporate blockbusters were never about that. And you see what happens today with Netflix. I mean, it is be the behemoth that it is today simply because the fact that when it didn't have enough money or as it was building itself up to, to start making its own new projects and its own original material, they built itself on the backbone of shows from yesteryear. The office was huge for them and other shows for, you know, that were on there for years and years and years were the top rated shows that consistently they went to. And you, exactly. like, like you said, that that knowledge that, hey, not only does new stuff need to be put out there, but there's a huge uh, demand to watch older things that are out there, shows, series, movies, what have you, that if you have exclusively on your outlet could have made the difference between so, Netflix or Blockbuster. What, what amazes me about it is that the economics for that business, particularly in a Blockbuster store, were wildly profitable, yet Blockbuster never embraced it. You spoke about television shows. TV shows for rental in our stores were as much as 20% of the business. It was an enormous business, and you could see the whole binge-watching phenomena evolving at that time yeah. because we were renting it at prices that were cheap enough for somebody to come in and rent a whole season for about 5 or $6, and, and that... In our stores, that's kind of what started the whole binge watching thing. Blockbuster didn't have the inventory or the pricing to build that, that, that kind of customer base. So Netflix did it. Once again, it is Alan Payne. He is the author of the awesome book, and I'm going through it right now, and I'm really having a great time reading it. You got to check out his book. It is Built to Fail, the inside story of Blockbuster's inevitable bust. It's available right now on Amazon or Barnes & Noble. You can go ahead and get it wherever you get your books. It's a must read, especially if you're interested as far as the not only just the nostalgic pop culture aspect of Blockbuster, but also the, the business side of it. And I'm a freak on the business side of it. I mean, I look at what the box office does every single weekend and go deep into that and the how and the why. When it comes to video games, the same thing. I was like, okay, that's great. It's a good game. But how well is it selling? Same thing as far as in the arena of what we're seeing now with Netflix and all the streaming outlets that are out there. But like you said, once you saw that market trending in the late 2000s, as far as people being able to purchase things online and download it directly, there was no need for a middleman. Well, I'll tell you what, Alan, it's been great having you on. But the last question I have for you is, okay. it's a good one. Okay, it's time for you to be the pitch seller. It's time for you to be the to give everybody the hard sell on your awesome book, Built to Fail. Why do people need to read this awesome book? Which again, I'm already well into. I told you I was on the the chapter Death by DVD, and that alone, you know, when I saw that, I was just <laughs> like, I got to get to that. So I'm I'm right there. I'm right there. So I want to ask you this: When it comes to your book, why do people need to get Built to Fail? I think the, the, a couple of reasons. Number one, it, it was such a part of people's lives for, for so many years. 
And, and it's hard to overstate the significance of it for about a 25 year period. Over half of the population of the country was in a video store almost every week. There's nothing that has replaced it since. I heard y'all talking on an earlier podcast about all the streaming services. Well, it's a, that's a complicated issue. Back then, it was very simple. You could go to a Blockbuster store and everything was there. Yeah, It was a much simpler time and, and it was a fun time. And the, the book is written in such a way that you don't have to be a business geek to understand it. I don't think that's that was the intent because I know so many people are, in, are familiar with Blockbuster if they want to try to understand, better understand what happened to it. Uh, and I'll also add uh, millions of people of the last Blockbuster documentary. And, and that documentary gets the story right about what happened to Blockbuster, but it only scratches the surface. So if you want to know more about what really happened, the book is the perfect companion. They did a great job telling the story, but you know a book can get into it a lot more detail. And I think that's what the book does. Well, I'm going to be finishing up here tonight and tomorrow, and then I'm going to be checking out before we go on air for Friday's show, I'm going to be checking out The Last Blockbuster again on Netflix. The (laughs) irony, the irony is just there. It's just so funny. It's just, okay, I'm going to say when that was pitched as far as a possible entry place, I met Netflix when they first got proposals. Can I put you on hold? So they put them on hold, the producers on hold, and they just probably laughed for five minutes straight yeah. before they put them back off a hold and said, yeah, we'll take a shot at it. No problem. Well, the, the interesting thing is, is the documentary contradicts the narrative that has been pushed by Netflix all these years, that they're the ones that did in Blockbuster. And certainly they were a factor, but the, it wasn't the only factor. And the documentary kind of kabunks that a little bit and talks about how Blockbuster had a lot more problems than just Netflix. Yeah. So it kind of, and Reed Hastings put a book out just a, a year ago. And one of the big narratives of it was that, yeah, Blockbuster failed to transition to digital. Well, yeah, they did, but they were dead before then. Yeah. So, so that snowball was rolling already downhill. The snowball started back in the 90s, really. And I think that's what people will find interesting about the book. And that's why it's called Built to Fail, because Blockbuster needed to have a major transformation in order to position itself even in the 90s, to be successful. And it had a very difficult time doing it. I'll tell you what, you are going to find all that and more. And if you're interested in not only about 90s and early 2000s culture, about the way we lived and about something that was so impactful and so important to our pop culture, like the Blockbuster video chain, you need to check out Built to Fail, the inside story of Blockbuster's inevitable bust. You got to check it out today. You can get it as an ebook. You can get it as a hardcover. You can get it as a soft cover. Just, you can get this book available right now at Amazon and Barnes and Noble, wherever you get your books. It's a must read. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm having a great time reading it. You have my highest compliments so far on it. I just cannot tell you what already a joy for me to read it is. So I cannot thank you enough for the opportunity, not only to read it, but obviously I cannot thank you enough to have the opportunity to speak to you here, but any last thoughts, Alan, on the way out? You said it perfectly. I support you a hundred percent. Sounds good indeed. But Thank yes. You. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. Well, I'll tell you what, I've had a great read and you know, it's, it's not that often I get a great read right now talking about some of the things that I experienced and went through. It is so fantastic to do so, but once again, you got to go ahead and check out built to fail. Just type in built to fail book right there on Amazon. I tried it earlier and it comes right up. A week after it came out, it was a number one bestseller on Amazon. So it's easy to find. Now it's an Amazon hot seller. So there you go. The irony of that as well. Amazon, (laughs) the irony of that book on Amazon should not be lost as well. It's a a great story. It really is. I was happy to be able to tell it. It's great. Uh, Absolutely. And it is a great story. Again, it is built to fail please go ahead and get a chance to buy this book, to go ahead and read it, and you will be glad you did. It is Alan Payne. And Alan, you're most welcome to come back anytime you want, talking about Blockbuster, the industry, your thoughts, your memories, anything you want at all. And obviously, again, to push the book, because it is something that definitely people need to know about and read. Just any opportunity you can, you're always welcome back on the program. That'd be fun. Just let me know when. You got it, Alan. Thank you so much for being on the show and, of course, being part of the pop.
Culture Cosmos. If you need your video game fix, be sure to check out Retro City Games. Located in Town Square on Las Vegas Boulevard or in Henderson, Nevada, Retro City Games has the cure for all your video game vices. Retro games and games for current consoles, Nintendo, Sega, PlayStation, Xbox, and more. Retro City Games has all the staples from any library and some highly collectible offerings too. So pick up a few games today at Retro City Games in Town Square on Las Vegas Boulevard or in Henderson, Nevada. Retro City Games is your video game game metropolis and we're back to close out the show this is the pcc multiverse want to thank so much alan payne the author of built to fail the inside story of blockbusters inevitable bus for being on the program today please go get his amazon best-selling book right now you want to go ahead and check that out on not only on amazon you can go ahead and get it at barnes and noble the same places where you can go ahead and get josh's congratulations you suck buy them both do a double book buying right there at Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Plus, also as well, I want to thank TJ Johnson for stopping by and sharing his thoughts on the controversial game Six Days in Fallujah and also Godzilla vs. Kong as well. But my friend, before we head on out, some quick TV and video game thoughts. American Gods just got canceled. And I also want to say that they're thinking at stars about doing a movie, but the producers are trying to shop around for maybe another season or whatnot on another outlet. Like we've seen from some other shows that we're able to go ahead and latch on to some other streaming outlets. I want to hear your thoughts on American gods getting canceled on stars. And do you think it deserves another run? So I've only seen the first season. I keep wanting to watch the rest of it, but it's such a dark show. It's so heavy that it's not like something you want to turn on at the end of the day to kind of like shut your brain off to go to sleep. Like it's not that kind of show. It's the kind of show where like you have to like be alert to watch it and you have to be able to like not become depressed from watching things because that's what that show does. You just, it puts you in a very dark mindset. It portrays the world and like the things that we uh, worship, like in the real world, like they, everything like that is embodied in this show. And so it's a very dark show. It's also a very deep show. And so that being said, like, I can see why it is being canceled. You look at a show like Black Sails, right? That's the prequel series to Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. Everyone kept hoping they were going to see like a Treasure Island show, but that never materialized because things on stars seemed to lose steam really quick. And yeah. though Neil Gaiman's American Gods show was was good and people enjoyed it it's something that fizzled out real quick and the only thing that seems to have any like lasting momentum on stars is outlander absolutely that's the only thing that seems to be continuing on let's just say stars decided to fold up tomorrow i see outlander getting picked up by a netflix or something like that stars is going to have a struggle to keep staying around for the long term that's for sure right yeah what are your thoughts out there on american gods being canceled do you want to see another season? Are you looking forward to maybe a movie finality for it as being talked about for stars? Or would you like to see it on another outlet getting some more love? Share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. One more show that's in the news. And for you CSI fans out there, this came out of the blue, but not quite unexpected. That CSI Vegas as it's being called now, even though the original CSI was based in Las Vegas, according to what everybody saw on the show each and every week. That's being picked up again by CES as a, I guess, a continuance of the series in a fashion, but it is being renamed CSI Vegas. It's going to be developed for CBS. William Peterson and Georgia Fox, two of the major names from that series, are returning to the show. Plus, maybe one or two of the regulars are being added, but a whole bunch of new people are being added into the mix. CSI was a show that dominated the ratings in the earlier part of the century and was one time the number one television show in the world. I think it's a great idea. I mean, worst comes to worst, you could go ahead and put it on streaming outlets if it doesn't materialize well for CBS. But your thoughts on returning to the world of CSI? It's a show that I grew up with. You know, I remember Thursday nights watching. Who yeah, you, you? you know, and that theme song played. And I, I remember like staying up watching the show with my mom and dad. It's kind of like a family night for us, you know, just sit at home, watch, watch CSI. Yeah, like I, I remember it, it had like some really like 
weird stuff on it sometimes because there's only so many ways that you could kill people and have the mystery get solved that they really had to like spin some yarn sometime it was almost like was that show on spike tv a thousand ways to die like it almost seems like they were taking notes from that sometimes yeah i don't know i just like it it became really old really quick and that being said like people who watch tv in 2021 like they're always looking for something new so that makes me believe that this show probably this this revive probably won't last very long i'm not going to count csi out but you could be right. There could be like that initial nostalgic kick and then who stays with the series, that amount of people will have to wait and see. I remember when I was managing a rental car facility and guests would come flying down to visit Las Vegas for the first time and they would ask me about all the fictional hotels that were in the show because they they would name like a, a MGM or they name it like a Bellagio, but they would also have like fictionally named oh. hotels. Mm-hmm. And it's funny, people would always ask me about those hotels. And I'm like, um, I hate to tell you, you can't have lunch there because it doesn't exist. Yeah, what CSI did do for me, you know, in terms of like the Las Vegas hotels was make me not want to stand by the window too long. Because <laughs> either somebody was going to, uh, you know, or they were someone's going to come up behind you and push you off the balcony. Like that made me very weary of uh, Las Vegas hotel windows. We're going to go ahead and see what's going to happen if the nostalgia and love for CSI will return in CSI Vegas. Who are you? Who, 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 who when it comes to CSI Vegas? And are you excited for a return to crime scene investigation? Share us your thoughts, popculturecosmos at yahoo.com. Well, my friend, it's been a great episode. But before we head on out, are you ready to return to Arcade Paradise? It's an interesting game that's kind of different. I mean, I guess you're the owner of a laundromat and you're given clearance to expand it with more washers and dryers. And in turn, instead, you try to relive the nostalgia of bringing in arcade games. And I guess you go and progress through the game by playing all these different arcade games. So I want to hear your thoughts on returning to Arcade Paradise. It looks interesting. I've been reading about it here. If it was like an arcade builder, like a simulator, that would be fun. But it sounds like you're really just playing through a bunch of like old arcade games. And like in that case, I don't know how interested I am in that because I'm not very good at the old arcade games. My wife is like constantly beating me in Galaga. I don't know like how interested I would be in something like that. It's going to be for me a little bit interesting because the fact it does take me to my times back playing in the arcades every day and always going to the mall they go have a great time and then checking out places like a laundromat or a liquor store to play the latest arcade games that were shuttled around all the time so i'm looking forward to it i'm not overly excited for it it all depends on the actual arcade games you're going to play are they actually going to be real licensed games or are they going to go ahead and be simulations of games that were played around that era so I don't know. I have to wait and see. I'm, I'm, I'm holding out hope that it'll be something worth going into. I don't understand the real world part of it. Are you trying to expand your laundromat forward? Are you trying to expand your arcade database? I don't really get how it's an action adventure game outside of what you do as far as the arcades are concerned, but I'm intrigued. Nonetheless, I'm intrigued. What are your thoughts out there on returning to Arcade Paradise? Share us your thoughts. PopCultureCosmos at Yahoo.com. Well, my friend, it's been a great episode. I cannot thank you enough for sitting in the big chair on the Friday show. For Mr. Marcus De La Garza, who I'm expecting to come back next week, looking forward to that. Any last thoughts on the way out? You know, I want to talk about the Suicide Squad trailer next time we talk. We'll talk about Suicide Squad, Falcon and Winter Soldier. How's that progressing? Because episode three drops this weekend. Also want to make sure everybody knows out there that part two of our WrestleMania preview with John Orlando from the PVD cast, that's going to drop on Monday as well. So looking forward to it. Josh, cannot thank you enough as always. And I'm looking forward to seeing you Monday right here at the Pop Culture Cosmos. So for Josh Peterson, this is Gerald Glass. This is another beautiful day in paradise right here in the PCC multiverse. We thank you for listening. And here's hoping you have yourself 
a grave.